e-commerce is definitely growing across the board and obviously COVID accelerated all the trends. And so it was always a little bit of a challenge, you know, trying to get the wheels turning on e-commerce because it is a big commitment. Mm -hmm. And so we learned a lot in terms of, you know, having a more regional focus, making sure we can optimize our logistics and things like that. Hi there, food enthusiasts. My name is Chris Rechkowski. Again, here is your host today on the Future Foodcast, where we talk with thought leaders in today's food industry and discuss the trends and technology that will and is shaping the future of food. I'm really happy to be speaking with Max Rivest today of Wise Tea. Uh, Max joins us from uh, British Columbia in Western Canada. Is that correct, Max? Yeah, I'm actually, um, I'm in Euclid. That's where I live, but I'm, I'm kind of between Vancouver and Euclid all the time. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome again to the podcast today and excited to have you here. And, um, you know, it's always interesting to hear where you know, today's entrepreneurs have come from and, and what led them into this business. So maybe give a little bit of backstory on yourself and what led you to start the company you're leading now, Wise T. Uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in Vancouver. Um, I was a, a multi-sport athlete my whole life, just always doing something uh, either in the mountains or on, on the ice playing hockey. And you know, growing up when I was about 15 years old, it was like that giant surge of energy drinks. And uh, I tried an energy drink one time and I basically decided immediately that this stuff is basically poison mm. and it doesn't, it doesn't improve performance by any means. If anything, it actually destroys it. And so, you know, going into the professional world as a, as a young adult, I started drinking coffee because that was kind of like, you know, it's a cultural norm to get things done. You've got to drink more coffee. And uh, eventually that led into, you know, having this aggressive overdose of caffeine when I was studying and, and working at the same time. And my doctor said, you know, you got to get off of coffee. It's, it's basically just, you know, ruining you. And, you know, I always liked iced teas, but I never drank them because they were always so high in sugar. Mm -hmm. And it was always like this biggest, it was always the biggest fallback. It was like either you have an unsweetened tea that's very bitter you know, like an American iced tea or just like an unsweetened bottled iced tea. And they were always so bitter and the quality was very low. And, and then the other option was something that has 40 plus grams of sugar that tastes great, but is terrible for you. And I always thought that was just kind of, you know, ridiculous in terms of what you can get at the store level, you know, at a gas station, whatever, like the options were very limited. And Literally right after I had this caffeine overdose, drinking too much coffee, my doctor's like, you got to drink tea. And I was like, you know, there's really nothing out there that I find is relevant to kind of modern needs or tastes. And like a month later, uh, we came across an article about this new study of the coffee leaf and how it's been studied for about seven years. And they discovered all these amazing findings that it's very healthy for you. It's got strong anti-inflammatory properties. It's got some rare polyphenols and compounds that are only found in a few plants in nature and how it's been consumed for hundreds of years. You know, most of the reports going 300 years back, but some of them even talking about the Ethiopian monks 2000 years ago. And Ethiopia is actually where the coffee plant originates from. It's where it had like the natural kind of evolution of the plant. It then got exported elsewhere around the world. So we thought that was really interesting. Well, there's this overlooked leaf that basically is getting pruned off of the plant for maintenance for nine months of the year. And so we started doing some more research for basically a, like a project topic. It was going to be uh, an entrepreneurship project that was for the second half of, a, of our master's program uh, in Southwest France. I basically quit my work and I, I sold everything I owned. I hated my job and I went to France and went to school there. And yeah, lo and behold, we fell on this idea. So as we started peeling back the layers, you know, realizing the coffee industry is extremely seasonal. You only have three months a year. We can actually harvest the bean. And that's where basically most of the money is generated. And the rest of the year, only about 10% of the workers are actually employed. And they're doing things like maintenance and cleanup and, and kind of cyclical, cyclical pruning, uh, you know, uh, cycles, I suppose. And with all these prunings, they're just kind of tossing them out. And so we realized, well, wait a second here maybe there's something we can make out of the leaf because, you know, it's very healthy. It's been consumed as a very rudimentary style of a tea, basically very, very minimal processing. 
uh, and also been consumed in different ways for, for kind of uh, for health benefits and things like that. Mm. And meanwhile, in the same at the same time, in that off season, everyone's really struggling to make ends meet. They have no income. There's no foreseeable income, you know, until the, until nine, nine months later in the cash season for the bean. And so we realized, you know, maybe we can make this work. Like, why don't we actually craft the leaves like a traditional tea? You know, if the if the Camilla sinensis plant, the, the traditional tea leaf that's been used for green tea, black tea, oolong, matcha, et cetera, it's been, it's been done a million different ways for over 3,000 years. Mm-hmm. Why don't we apply that same craft methodology to a different leaf and see what happens? And so my co-founder, him being from Southwest France, growing up in like the cradle of fermented beverages, mm-hmm. you know, his hometown was about 20 minutes away from the cognac region. Bordeaux is, is world famous for red wine. And so for him, it was like, well, this is a really cool opportunity to try to like make a whole new category of product based on real fermentation and actual, you know, high quality, high class, uh, you know, type of crafting. And for me as a consumer growing up in the sports world, And also just being a big fan of innovation and and health and fitness, having an opportunity to have, you know, potentially at the time we didn't know potentially a very healthy and and tasty tea that's lightly caffeinated as an alternative, you know, bring that to the market. Maybe it opens up something totally new. And so we spent about, I think, I think it was like five months trying to find a sample of something that we could purchase online just to taste the coffee leaf. And, you know, somewhere on like the 40th page of Google, we found this guy selling some stuff and eventually we kind of dug it out. And it was a very, it was very, (laughs) I mean, I got to give the guy credit for at least getting something done, but it was very poorly, poorly executed and poorly made and whatnot. And, and we tasted the tea and in the end, it actually was just, it was the fact that it wasn't bitter was basically Mm -hmm. like the big selling point for me uh, to actually pursue this. And so we're like, well, wait a second. If this, if this isn't bitter and it still delivers caffeine, it still delivers, uh, you know, high antioxidant properties, et cetera, and it can make a year round income for, you know, 25 million coffee farmers around the world that are really struggling, you know, this is something worth looking at. And so as we kept doing more research at school, by the end of the school year, we presented, you know, in our, in our big kind of uh, fake investment round type of thing mm-hmm. that we do at the end of most kind of master's courses. And, uh, and we did super well. And, you know, we were pretty confident that this is something worth looking at. And I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. My co-founder, not so much. He, he kind of grew up with other uh, office jobs and things like that. And he was really convinced, like, you know, this is actually worth doing. And so that summer, we basically, you know, I was like, hey, I got some room on my credit card. Let's just go to Nicaragua and find some farmers. And uh, so we basically started knocking on doors and coffee farms and just going around and uh, you know, about a month into it, we finally found someone that could, you know, work with us. And we basically traded a big bag of coffee leaves for a bottle of 12 year Florida Kanye rum, uh, which is like the, the kind of famous rum in Nicaragua. Mm-hmm. And um, our very first batch that we made, you know, without knowing almost anything on how to process tea leaves, let alone coffee leaves, because no one has ever done it like that we made the first batch and we tasted it and we're like, holy crap, this is actually so smooth. And it's really, really tasty. And it, it tastes like, you know, a green tea, but way better. It doesn't have that grassy aspect. doesn't have the tannic kind of finish or that dryness you get from a traditional tea. And so we knew it had legs and we had, we barely knew anything about processing tea at the time. So that was back in, that was basically Halloween, 2013. And um, so we spent a year after that doing, the regulatory stuff and kind of figuring out health Canada, CFIA approvals, doing all the, basically the, the, the fine print. And Mm -hmm. uh, we eventually launched online in 20, in, uh, in 2014, the fall after that, but basically it it all really started from kind of my personal need to have like a healthy beverage and, and knowing that tea has always been like kind of the original energy drink that is like legitimately healthy and doesn't take away from your energy. Um, you know, and then seeing how we could apply the same idea to the coffee leaf instead. And, and the coffee leaf, thankfully, just tastes a lot smoother. You know, mm-hmm. that's just the way, the way that we craft it, you know, multiple steps. It actually just creates this really smooth, kind of almost lightly sweet taste on its own. And uh, if you order like the original coffee leaf that you have, that we have on our website, just the original blend, mm-hmm. you can taste it straight up and you can tell right away, like, oh, wow, this has kind of got some 
roasted hazelnut type of honey tones, uh, you know, kind of caramel in, in a way. And that being said, still delivering caffeine. So it's, it's definitely unique. Uh, and, we're, and we're the first ones to really pioneer this in terms of a, an elevated product. Hmm. That's uh, a pretty amazing origin story. And it goes back quite a ways. Um, I, do, I want to talk a little bit later about more, you know, the, some of the nutritional benefits, because you touched on that lightly, but I understand you have a relatively interesting supply chain story also in one of your co-founders. And uh, I wonder if you can maybe tell us a little bit about how you, it sounds like a, actually now have a co-founder who is the beginning of the supply chain for you. Yeah, so basically, it's a funny story. Uh, the very first supplier that we started working with kind of more consistently, at first, he seemed like a really great guy. And, you know, he was basically the only guy that said yes, in terms of creating a bit of a long term partnership. And over time, we realized that he was basically just ripping us off and taking advantage of, you know, two young white kids from up north that, you know, coming into the coffee fields and you know, it was, it's just an easy opportunity for anyone to kind of like, you know, pull a fast one on us. And so, you know, I understand that uh, from their perspective, but basically he was just kind of ripping us off. We started realizing this. And so we started kind of asking around for another, another partner to, to build something with. And there was an ethical coffee buyer um, named Amanda who introduced us to Enrique Ferrofino. And Enrique is a third generation coffee farmer and he's, his family's been doing it, you know, very ethically and, and in a very high quality premium manner for a long time mm -hmm. and, and very advanced in terms of uh, regenerative cycles and, you know, making things very healthy and, and creating like a microclimate for the actual farm itself. Uh, trying to have like a, as much of a closed loop system as, you know, as possible. And, and so we eventually met Enrique and you can tell when we told him the concept and what we were doing, you know, we were already been selling a bit of product at that point. We've already done some really nice blends and great tasting products. And you could tell his like, you know, he was just lighting up inside, like, holy mm. crap, this is an opportunity to, to lead the next generation of coffee farmers and also create something that is legitimately sustainable at a high scale and not just a, a one-off kind of you know, short-term benefit for farmers that eventually would just erode away, you know, or, or needs a ton of maintenance. And so in this case, he really understood the, the high scale capability of the concept. And, you know, the, the first time we went to his farm, we were there and he was like, hey, let's just grab a bunch of leaves. We'll get a bunch of staff to just go harvest some stuff. And, and then we'll kind of mess around and see where it goes. And it was the first time we actually had people to help us because at the last place, it was basically my co-founder and I, Arno, we were doing everything ourselves and we would occasionally get a bit of help to harvest, but like it was legitimate labor work constantly to just like actually make this happen. And you could tell that the first partner, you know, wasn't really vested in this and didn't really care. So we go to the new guy's spot and all of a sudden the first day there's 25 people helping us out and we got like, you know, a decent sized warehouse of like full of you know, this first kind of batch of leaves that we're going through and we're like, oh my God, like this guy is so organized mm -hmm. and you know, everyone has been working here for five or six years at least. And that just goes to show that people want to stick around. They like working for him and, and being there. And so when we were there, actually, this is a funny story. When we were there, one of the fertilizer salesmen in the industry popped by and kind of said hi. And we had known him from the last guy as well. And he realized we were there and he's like, wait a second, you guys are supposed to be working with the other guy. And you have like this agreement that he was aware of. So he leaves and he basically calls the other farmer and says, Hey, these guys are at Enrique's farm right now. Like what's going on? Sure enough, by the time we get back to town to get cell phone reception, we have the original guy we're working with. Who's like texting me saying, Oh, breach of contract. And I have all of my, my military contacts and we're going to keep you in the country. And, you know, put you in jail as soon as you try to leave and all this stuff. And we were freaking out. I mean, you know, we were 26 years old. We were supposed to leave in about a week and we're getting this message, like full panic mode, had to like call my friends to find a lawyer and go through all this rigmarole. But at the end of the day the you know, it all kind of, it all kind of, you know, when the dust settled, nothing really happened on that end, but in the moment it was terrifying. And that's just kind of the things you deal with when, you know, you're in a, in a developing country and you're kind of dealing with a, a third, like for us, a third language that was, you know, rusty, but functional. And eventually 
after all this went down, you know, Enrique really kind of started to grasp the long-term vision and really understood that there's a huge opportunity to create a lot of interesting products with this and, and has a lot of sustainable benefits for the farm, but also for even for general consumers that want to get off of sugar. And so, you know, trying to figure out a supply chain where no one knows the actual cost to produce the product at scale. We don't even know if it's scalable from a cost perspective. If the consumer in the end has to pay $20 for a serving of the product, then the whole idea doesn't make any sense. It'll just never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But over time, you know, we're trying to create an agreement where, you know, he could help us kind of fund a bit of production up front. And, and then, you know, we could kind of backfill that with the sales and then start to kind of place some POs and find a price that makes sense. But in the beginning, when no one knows pricing, it's super hard. So we were always kind of like in, in no man's land with the mm -hmm. agreements and paperwork and whatnot. But, uh, you know, kind of long story short, we brought him in as a, as a, as a third co-founder and just split the company three ways, mm -hmm. which, which to, to our knowledge, we, you know, obviously we can't know for sure, but to our knowledge, we're the only coffee or tea brand in the world where the actual farm owner is a, is a major equity uh, shareholder and he's also on the directors, you know, board of directors and, and he's considered a founder, you know, without him, we wouldn't have the amazing quality product that we do have. We wouldn't have the, the capacity to scale properly. And his farm is just, is really next level. You know, we talked to, at the time we were talking to the Nicaragua uh, export development agency mm -hmm. and saying, Hey, like we're looking for farmers to work with. We really want like, who's the cream of the crop kind of thing. And they came back and said, oh, Enrique Ferrafino, this is the guy you need to talk to. And we're, we actually just started talking to him two days before that. And so it was kind of a nice validation to have a government agency say, hey, he's the best in the country. Just go talk to him. And we had already begun that discussion. So mm -hmm. it was nice to know that, you know, he was respected on a on literally like a federal level. And then as well as kind of in the in the ethical coffee buying circles for premium brands and whatnot. Right. So it was a it was a nice match. Uh, me doing the marketing, my co-founder Arno doing the finance and back-end operations, and then Enrique doing the production and export and and the on-the-ground innovation. You know, crafting different types of batches using using different sub-varietals of arabica leaf, which also change the flavor beyond just the processing techniques. So there's so much craft that can, that that will still develop and happen, and there's so many ways to make it. But right now we're trying to keep it really simple and just have something that is really tasty, delicious and scalable to then, you know, build the brand and, and slowly kind of start to diversify into these new kind of micro lots and cool limited edition things, but that'll come a bit further down the line. Sure. Well, through all that you've been talking about in a couple different aspects of your origin story here and the growth story are really amazing, but you use the word sustainability pretty frequently. And, and that's a topic that we focus on in this podcast series as well as sustainability. And I guess I see how some of that comes through between with your interest in the product uh, for sure. But how do you see sustainability really working through your supply chain? It, it sounds like, like, as you said, you have farmers that are well, not only a partner, but committed to ethical production. How does this all culminate for you as a business in supporting sustainability from really from the beginning to the end of your production and supply process? Yeah. So, you know, our goal in the very beginning was, you know, one, we have to make a, a good tasting product. Otherwise, even if we have a sustainable story, it doesn't matter. It just won't sell. Um, at the end of the day, that's just reality. And so we managed to make a great product. And then after that, it was trying to figure out, okay, how much impact will this create at the farm level in the off season when people need work? And since, uh, since working with Enrique starting in 2016, we've actually generated over a hundred thousand work hours for coffee farmers in the off season. And that's spread across about 120 people. And, you know, it, it may, for some, for some people, it doesn't sound like it's a lot, but like, you know, it's still a drop in the bucket on the global scale, but hundred thousand work hours that didn't exist before is pretty monumental in the coffee industry because these folks really struggle in the off season. You know, the general, the kind of general story that a lot of coffee farmers go through is, you know, once, once March hits, basically there's no more beans to harvest and you're waiting until October. And in that period, you're basically just running out of cash slowly. And typically, you know, the parents will split up, the dad will go somewhere else to find another job. 
or go to this or the whole family will move to the cities which makes the kids kind of get pulled out of their local school into another one and then mm -hmm. when they start running out of money the kids get pulled out of school entirely because they can't afford basic things like you know pens and paper and whatnot and and in, in places like nicaragua the government doesn't support schooling a whole lot they don't really have a lot of money and so you know, it's even worse when you're in rural towns where all of the kind of raw, you know, agricultural products are created. They don't have a lot of money for that because they're not, there's not enough density for them to kind of justify supporting these schools. And so mm -hmm. there's really no resources at all. It's just the odd NGO supported school here and there. And, and NGO money is very fleeting. You know, some years you have lots of support, other years you have nothing. And so when we're seeing this on the ground in person, we're like, oh my God, like people have to migrate. The kids are never in the same school or at least never consistently in a school program and so the average age after interviewing a bunch of folks the average age and, and teachers included um, the average age kids drop out of school is about 11 or 12 years old so by like grade five or six they drop out and then we talk to to these uh these ladies that are picking you know leaves and beans in the fields and they're like yeah like i'm 35 i have three kids and i'm going back to grade four right now to kind of learn how to read again and properly get back to school and i regret dropping out but i didn't really have a choice you know like mm -hmm. it's this is the reality of things in, in the majority of the coffee growing world and, and other agricultural industries as well and so when we saw this go down we're like man like this is really brutal and and you know we know that the leaf can have a huge impact and you know when you're a consumer in a grocery store and this can is on the shelf, you're looking at it for like the brass tacks, you know, does this, do I think this is going to taste good? Is that, is that the right price? And does it meet my nutritional needs from a, a health perspective or whatnot? You know, you don't think about the downstream effects of, or rather upstream effects of, you know, people producing the product and creating a year round living. So, you know, when we started realizing the real impact it could, it could create beyond just like a theoretical you know, concept that we had, we started realizing like, this is actually really huge. And so um, that is what really kind of made us even more motivated because it was just an idea. And then we realized, you know what, this is actually scalable. This is creating legitimate impact. And now these farmers in the off season, they can't wait to do the next cycle and pick up, you know, all the coffee leaves, you know, to produce the tea because we're employing, you know, over 100 people in those in those kind of chunks of time, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it gives everyone a cash infusion that they typically wouldn't have. And so that is is very much the on the ground sustainability component, you know, aside from kind of basically repatriating food waste uh, and, and upcycling a byproduct into, you know, essentially a premium product. There's that whole component as well. Um, but then when it comes to you know on the more consumer level type of thing you know in market we have you know the fact that we're launching actually in about two weeks we're launching the world's first sugarcane based tea bags mm -hmm. and those are backyard compostable in two to three weeks they're a premium pyramid tea bag no staples no glue we're not using uh, any wood fiber so we're not using any trees to produce it and essentially it's created using sugarcane alcohols uh, that, that, that get kind of transformed into fibers, which is a very advanced science. Um, and it's, it's, it's really next level. Um, but the most amazing thing is that it, it's completely tasteless and it has a very premium aspect. And again, backyard compostable, whereas a lot of the bioplastic tea bags right now, they say they're biodegradable. There's a very big difference between biodegradable and compostable. Mm -hmm. Biodegradable, you know, really depends on your city organic facilities. In most cases, it takes at least two years to break down and it does leave behind some kind of microplastics and things like that. So we're, we're launching our, you know, the sugarcane tea bags based on, a, on, a, on an effort that's been actually building over two years in terms of innovation and getting the supply chain set up for that. So that's, you know, a kind of an end to end story of sustainability really at the farm level, all the way to the consumer level. And when it comes to you know, from a health perspective, day to day, you know, the average North American consumes 77 grams of sugar per day. And that adds up to about 62 pounds per year. You know, I'm 180 pounds. If I was drinking that much sugar or eating that much sugar, a third of my body weight per year would be sugar, which it, it, it just makes me, ugh, it makes me feel yeah. so <laughs> ugh, like just uncomfortable just thinking about that. So when it comes from sustainability, from a health perspective, you know, 50% of the added sugars that we consume are in beverages alone. 
Imagine mm -hmm. cutting out 50% of your annual sugar just by making a cleaner beverage choice. Mm -hmm. Something that can still give you caffeine, something that still gives you a premium quality taste and, you know, has a very nice clean aspect and tons of health benefits. So that's really where we're pushing towards this and, and having a more sustainable choice for beverage and for your mm -hmm. diet, for your health for long term. And, you know, the diabetes rates and, and heart disease and all these things that are related to sugar they're still massive, like they're still going up and it, there's not really a solution for that right now. A lot of people are drinking seltzer water instead, which is at least a good move in that direction, but it doesn't have necessarily, you know, added health benefits and whatnot. Right. So no from the, that's kind of the, the full picture really from like at the, the, the plant level at the ground all the way to the consumer essentially. And, and that's the kind of holistic vision that we have. Right. Well, it's amazing. And I think you've described not only a product, but a supply chain and a business ethos that, uh, frankly, most other companies would kill for, um, you know, especially if we, you look at other coffee companies, as an example, or chocolate companies where there's a tremendous um, interest, let's say, in equity across the supply chain, you know, especially at the front end of that supply chain, fair wages, um, leading to fair trade products, et cetera. Um, and they work very, very hard on that. And it's difficult to make progress but they still report that strongly to their their customers because they're they are making very sincere and good efforts. But you've got this all done. It's like the perfect scenario. How do you communicate this to your customers and let them know that from literally from the plant all the way to the product that they're consuming, you have micromanaged this in such a positive way that they're consuming a product that is not only helping them but helping people, every, every person that basically touches this product, how do you communicate that to the customers? You know, I will say that is an, it's an ongoing uh, work in progress and a challenge because in the very beginning, you know, being very bright eyed and, and kind of dare I say naive in terms of the, the real, the green aspect of the brand and how much appeal that would have, mm -hmm. We started realizing, you know, by marketing it as a very sustainable product that's helping folks overseas and, and really, you know, creating this, uh, I shouldn't say overseas, actually, I should say in Central America, uh, you know, creating all this, this benefits for them. In the end, people started seeing the brand as almost like an NGO kind of charity thing. And, and they mm -hmm. assumed that the product quality would be less because we're upcycling something. And our focus was really was really the primary story was about the social impact. And, you know, in the beginning, we got into a social impact incubator and we learned a ton there. And like, it, it gave us, it really kind of sharpened our pencil when it comes to, you know, things like fundraising and, and actually building the company itself from a mm -hmm. foundational perspective. But I will say it did kind of put us in a bit of a bubble for, you know, the, the lens that we took uh, on our marketing because it was very social impact based and it was not, about taste. It was not about that exceptional satisfaction you get from a quality product. And, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard of the, the Simon Sinek golden circle, you know, um, why, how, and what essentially mm -hmm. we did that exercise in the beginning with the lens of the farmer in the sense of, you know, why are we doing this? Well, we want to create impact, social impact for farmers in the coffee mm -hmm. industry because they're really struggling. How are we doing it? Well, we're upcycling coffee leaves and what is the product? Well, we made a tea out of it and it's amazing. And that was kind of how we did the whole thing. And over the last few years, we realized, you know what? It doesn't connect with consumers enough. Hmm. You know, our story of going down there and, and working hand in hand with these folks for you know months on end and having a very emotional connection to that area, to that those, those folks and the people we work with, it doesn't mean anything to someone who's in the gas station who's going to pick a can up off off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Like it, it means literally nothing. They don't have the same context. They don't have the same background. So we started realizing, like, wait a second, we got to build this this golden circle with the lens of the consumer instead of the farmer, because mm -hmm. the consumer is the one who also was getting a lot of benefits in terms of you know having a low sugar alternative that still satisfies what they're looking for, it satisfies their needs. So instead of doing, you know, the farmer thing with the impact, we started looking at like, okay, so why are we doing this product? Well, there's too much sugar in the general North American diet in, in the global diet. We want to have a better alternative. So how are we doing that? You know, we're using coffee leaves and what's the product? It's an iced tea as well as our dry teas. 
And so changing that narrative entirely about having the consumer focus and, and the benefits that they get first out of it has dramatically improved our, our messaging and also just our general marketing approach. We have a way better understanding of that now. And I, you know, it's one of those things you you wish you did it years ago, you know, but you, some lessons take time to learn. And, and that's just part of, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and just being a, a yeah. human, you know, yeah. working on something. So that was a big shift for us. And, you know, and since then we've kind of been just learning more and more and realizing that the sustainable component, it really comes further down the line. And, you know, the hook for a lot of people is like, oh, wow, like just one gram of sugar in per can, like for them, that's an automatic draw, you know, and it starts getting, it ends up being like very kind of uh, utilitarian or very like practical in the very beginning to just have a bit of, a bit of a, you know, that interest to build. And as they start drinking the product and they have it multiple times, then they start getting interested in the brand and all the layers of the onion that, you know, you can't get to on a, on a supermarket shelf. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. And so there's a lot more kind of, it takes a bit more massaging to get to that point. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, I've seen this in talking with a lot of entrepreneurs um, over the past many months. And uh, as you mentioned, there's sometimes a barrier for customers to um, have time to care. Um, you know, if it takes, yeah five minutes or five hours to research the product, that's a problem. But what we've seen happening even in some products is they'll put a QR code on the package and you can look back to who produced this. Um, it sounds like a, you know, you're already there. You, um, and like you said, the consumer primarily wants a great product that probably has some, in your case, nutritional benefits with it as well. Um, but there does seem to be a tremendous groundswell of interest in overall sustainability and if, even if it's tertiary, it's, it's a key motivator for customers. And it sounds like that'd be, you know, another future opportunity for your products is able, is communicating that quickly. Yeah. They, the, the way that we see it, to be honest, we actually have a QR code on, I think this is, no, I don't have it with me right now. We actually have a QR code on our latest batch and I did a lot of testing before we decided, you know, what was the purpose of the QR code? In the very beginning, it was like, see where this is made, you know, go right to the source and whatnot. But I started testing that with a bunch of people and, and other folks in the, especially in the e-commerce world. And they were telling me like, you know what, it's, it's really great to do that. But at the end of the day, people will scan the code if they're going to win something, you know, like mm -hmm. they're going to win something. And so we're like, oh, I, I, I hate, I, as a storyteller, as, as someone who's, you know, very emotionally connected to the folks that were you know, helping, you know, create a living and also just really building the supply chain from scratch. And mm -hmm. I want to show people exactly where it's from and whatnot, but the challenge is you'll get way less people, you know, scanning that code than if you have someone that enters to win a, a contest or whatever. And so the, our, our goal here, essentially what we've done instead is scan the code to like enter to win some swag you get a coupon, you know, in your email inbox. And immediately in that, in the email, and I'm working on essentially like a quick follow-up pop-up after you sign up, it'll play like our one minute video that shows from farm to fridge and exactly, you know, the whole process of the coffee leaf where it's produced and everything. So actually kind of like, like bringing in this, this more, um, you know, uh, let's say financially motivated or more kind of product motivated customer and getting them to sign up and then immediately sliding in this, this kind of craft story. And so mm -hmm. that they understand that there's way more at play here than just, you know, cool iced tea with a logo and, and, right. and a QR code. So we're trying to kind of bridge the gap a little bit. Um, it ends up being, you know, it's, it's very altruistic to think that a lot of people want to immediately see the source and whatnot, but our, our brand is still so new, you know, mm -hmm. and, and when people want to engage with the brand and learn where it's from, in most cases, they'll just go to the website and really dig into it themselves versus right. you know the random customer and like delivering this kind of really heavy story with lots of detail it just doesn't it just doesn't work you know and we've yeah, gone down yeah. that road you know i've actually a, that's a for me a genuinely interest insight because as i've talked with others say doing similar or making similar efforts in supply chain tracking and supply chain transparency uh, making it available to customers and they're very enthusiastic about it and they report some good traction from that. But I, I suspect that what you found taps a fundamental sort of consumer factor, which is not just North American, but is global, which is 
you're, you benefit from having a hook there, if you will, a hook that uh, it, what's the benefit, what's the additional benefit from the customer? And then parallel with that is providing that information on the supply chain. Um, so I, I think that's actually super insightful that um, you're probably leading the pack there as well. And you've gone beyond maybe what others are doing and already also implementing, for example, a QR code to track and trace, but going beyond what actually happens on the shelf and consumers need a little bit more push to get them to even pull out their phone and scan the code. You know, it's funny, like we wanted to do a QR code three years ago and mm -hmm. actually even, even way before then on our, like our original boxes of dry tea, I don't have an, I don't have an example, but the original box of dry tea, we had an image of the farmer and it was very, very focused on the source and knowing the farmer and everything else. And I wanted to somehow register the image of the farmer as the QR code and have them scan. And this is back in like 2014. Mm -hmm. The problem is that QR codes were not really there yet. Mm -hmm. And literally only until COVID, it was QR codes were just had such a small adoption rate. And even then phones, most phones didn't inherently scan them yet. It was right. still getting implemented. And so literally only until COVID, like QR codes were still pretty early. And now because of COVID, it's like every menu at a restaurant is a QR code. It has fully normalized mm -hmm. it and the adoption curve just skyrocketed. And so now mm -hmm. we're finally ready to do that, which is like, I've kind of been waiting all this time to do that. So it's yeah. nice to know that, you know, people can actually understand what it is and, and they'll immediately kind of like, oh yeah, they'll just clue in right away and, and either scan mm -hmm. it if they're interested or not. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, you know, we've covered a lot about your supply chain, um, not a whole lot about your products yet, um, but maybe we can step beyond that. We, we basically, uh, we understand pretty clearly that, you know, there's an amazing product that um, you're essentially upcycling what had been waste, which is actually a very valuable and nutritious um, byproduct of coffee production. But what do you see coming for yourself and your company in the next two or three years as products? And what trends, what consumer demands are sort of leading you toward these new or expanded products? Um, you know, we have lots of ideas and there's like the long-term vision is to really have a few, a few ready to drink lines. Um, you know, different things like higher caffeine version, for example, um, all sorts of different flavors, of course, you know, potentially a sparkling version, things like that. Mm -hmm. To be honest though, like seeing other brands, reading lots of case studies, learning about, you know, what's learning about priorities early on in terms of scalability versus product diversity, things like that. Mm -hmm. As much as I want to launch, you know, another product line that's sparkling, uh, or a higher caffeinated version or like a matcha type version that would be fairly high caffeine, also extremely high in antioxidants. All those things sound really awesome and really sexy and fun. But to be honest, at the end of the day, every time you launch a new product, it's like you're launching a whole new brand and you have to work super hard to get it out there. And you're, mm -hmm. you're dedicating a lot of resources, time and money to produce something at a loss because it's going to be new, right. you know? If we're doing, for example, you know, in January, we should be doing about 200,000 cans. And um, if we wanna launch a single SKU, uh, like a new kind of one-off thing, you know, that's gonna be at least 30,000, 40,000 cans we need to dedicate. And it's right. gonna be selling at a loss. And right now, you know, we're working our way to really selling at profits because otherwise there's no way we can scale. And, right. and that goes back to the impact as well. You know, you have to sell profitably. Otherwise, if you can't scale, then you can't scale your impact. And then no one wins at the end of the mm -hmm. day. That's just the way it is. We don't want to operate this. We don't want to operate this as a break even. We need to be profitable to actually scale the impact and create, a, you know, a, a history making kind of story and, and, and changing the dynamic in the coffee industry. So in terms of, you know, future product lines and expansion, you know, I would love to say that within three years, we have these, all these different things, but to be honest, I think we're going to just keep fine tuning what we have. And maybe by, you know, 2024, we'll have our first kind of foray into potentially a sparkling version locally mm -hmm. where, you know, we can test it in Vancouver and, and, and the local market to see how it goes, or it'll just be, you know, some new flavors. And maybe we go from three flavors to five or, or, or maybe from four flavors to six at that point, we'll see. But to be honest, you know, Red Bull, 
they were selling six billion cans a year with only one SKU. Right. You know, it's 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 obviously an outlier example, but it just goes to show, you know, you can really dial in the formula and and make something really special and and mm-hmm. and just optimize something so 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 well that beyond that, you know, you don't have to diversify right away, right. even though it's extremely tempting. Yeah. You know, there's there's another thing to be said about you know creating new flavors. So you know, there's, there's two sides of the argument where if you create a new flavor, you can bring in new consumers that are looking for that kind of flavor in a beverage where, you know, let's say someone really loves black cherry. It's a bit of a polarizing taste for some mm-hmm. folks, but a lot of people love it, you know, and they'll, they'll ditch their Dr. Pepper or like, you know, other kind of highly sweet mm-hmm. drinks to go to a black cherry version of our product. The other aspect of that is, are we just creating more flavors for the same consumer that would buy this, the, like the existing right. flavor already? Are we kind of, are we just cannibalizing another skew to not really generate more sales, but just to have more diversity? Is that really worth doing right, right now? And, you know, and we're still learning when we scale these batches, you know, in the very beginning, when you do such a small batch, your ratios are kind of loose, so to speak. Mm-hmm. As you bring a 30,000 can batch up to 300,000 cans, those ratios will really affect the flavor on a high end. On, right. on the higher scale. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of growth and refinement R and D that has to happen. And the batch that we did just last week in Calgary, we actually had to adjust a couple of things here and there and the ratios and fine tune because the flavor will shift a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. and every batch is like slightly different ever, ever so slightly different. Mm-hmm. So we're always improving that. We're realizing there's a lot of work to do in that realm and there's still a lot of market testing. And, you know, next Friday we're doing a taste test basically with friends and family just to get a better indication of how things are progressing. So mm-hmm. I would love to say that we're going to like blow this out and do a ton of different products and whatnot, but you know, the roadmap for three years for now is going to be, is going to be very simple yes. and, and clean, but you know, in 10 years, I think we'll have a lot more variety and I'm excited to see where we go, you know, within that time range. And, you know, that certainly makes a lot of sense. And it's interesting to hear, you know, the thought process, the decision process that comes through as an entrepreneur, you know, there's, you know, some cold hard facts of why you will or won't do certain things. But, you know, another key point is that, frankly, why diversify into, you know, bubbles or something else? Because, you know, I can't go and get your a competitive product for what you're selling on the market. Um, you know, yeah. if you want this product, you know where to go. You basically have to go to C Max and, uh, and get that wise tea. And, and the, the cool thing that we're seeing actually is that a lot of people are really happy that it's not carbonated because mm-hmm. it doesn't bloat you, you know, so to speak. And also for an iced tea to be just a regular, still high quality iced tea that's low sugar and delicious and healthy and has social impact and has a direct source and everything else there's nothing like it in the category. And as soon as we start going into carbonation, then we're really fighting with all the seltzer waters. We're fighting with Coke and Pepsi, bubbly and all these other right. products that it is already such a sat- saturated market. So for us, it's like, well, do we want to go in that realm? You know, we're not really, we're not, we don't have the ammo for that right now. Right. To be, to be frank, even though, you know, it could be potentially the best version of this product. Like when it comes down to everything across the board, you know, probably a higher sugar carbonated version of this iced tea is actually the best product possible in terms of fighting mm-hmm. Coke and Pepsi, but we are not ready to fight with them. It's, right. it's not what we're going after right now. So we're going to win where we know we can win, where there's a lot of, a lot of room to grow and a huge gap in the market. And then we can assess those opportunities down the road. But, you know, if it was up to me, I would launch, you know, two new flavors next summer or even three, you know, and we would try carbonation. We would do all these things and, you know, do some matcha versions, et cetera. But all those things take time. They take a ton of money. And right now we're not in a position where we can just start like blowing a bunch of money in R and D and hoping that something hits. Right. Right. Well, I think again, we've covered almost all topics that you get involved with this business, but, you know, just real quickly um, as we start to wrap up, I'm curious to hear your thoughts and experience on what's been happening in e-commerce um, recently and some obvious global events that have been driving that, but how has that or how impacted your business or maybe not, because maybe you've already been focused on e-commerce. Um, well, I say in the beginning, uh, you know, 
COVID was a big challenge because we were literally in the middle of raising money to produce the first batch of iced tea when it all, when like March, Friday the 13th in March happened and basically the whole world went into lockdown. Uh, so that was a huge tumultuous few weeks just trying to figure out like, wow, like is our company just dead now? Cause we're just raising money and we're in the middle of a round and, and didn't have everything kind of put together in time. But eventually the dust settled and, you know, everyone knew that, okay, the world's going to keep going and, and we'll, you know, we still have a great product on our hands. So let's go do it. Um, our plan basically shifted a lot from going to like, we were going to do lots of events, lots of experiential gorilla sampling, like tons of stuff in the streets and whatnot. And then we basically, because of COVID, we had to shovel all of that into e-commerce. Mm. And so we started building the e-commerce side of things, uh, you know, and, and kind of focusing on that end. I, I can't say that it was, I can't say that it was extremely successful because I feel like if we spent the same amount of time and money into doing events and retail, it would have probably been more fruitful because the product, at the end of the day, you know, it's a drink. People want to taste it. It's a brand new drink. You know, it, it's made from something that no one has really seen before. And so for someone to spend $30 on a 12 pack and commit to something that they've never tried is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot it was a lot wrapped up in e-commerce to try to kind of break the ice on that. Um, and so it was always a little bit of a challenge, you know, trying to kind of get the wheels turning on e-commerce because it is a big commitment. And on top of that, when it comes down to it, you know, a $30 pack of iced tea weighs about 10 pounds and it's, you're basically shipping bricks. And from a, from a profitability perspective, you know, that's very expensive to move. Mm -hmm. And so we learned a lot in terms of, you know, having a more regional focus, making sure we can optimize our logistics and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a big challenge in the beginning in terms of where it's going forward. Um, I mean, right now, for example, cause we're going into the fall, it's, it's one of our best seasons for dry tea because there's lots of gifting and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, our dry teas have been developed over the last six, seven years and they are phenomenal. Like they're, they're amazing. They're dialed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're doing some more bundles and kind of shifting our focus to a little bit more dry tea leading into the Christmas season. Uh, so that's, that's always a nice kind of, uh, you know, bump in sales towards the end of the year. But in terms of like the general market trends, you know, in Canada, e-commerce is a little bit slower. Um, obviously, we don't have the density here that the U.S. does. So you're kind of generally fighting higher shipping costs and things like that. And, and, and sometimes that'll, that'll deter a lot of customers if you're, if you're even subsidizing the shipping costs or if they're paying out right. And, you know, I know that e-commerce is definitely growing across the board and obviously COVID accelerated all the trends, you know, a few years ahead. Um, that being said, for beverages in Canada on e-commerce, it's still very challenging, mainly because of shipping costs. Mm -hmm. um, in the U.S., though, you look at some brands like there's some fantastic examples like Sanzo or Olipop, you know, depending on which coast you're on, there's a lot of density and these brands are succeeding really well with e-commerce because people are more apt to buy some things online, you know, really quickly. And they want the new thing right away. Whereas in Canada, we're a bit more reticent. We're kind of waiting for the neighbor to say they like it and their other friend to say they like it and then they'll buy it. You know what I mean? Um, and that's just general, that's just kind of the general market. And, um, you know, when you compare us and Canada with e-commerce, what, what I do like about the progression in e-commerce now though, however, is it's like, you don't have to convince someone who's maybe a bit of a laggard when it comes to e-commerce adoption, you don't have to convince them anymore. You know, now it's like they've had to order stuff online basically. And, and they're now getting used to like feeling more comfortable with that e-commerce experience and getting more well-versed with how things kind of go in the, in the, in the kind of pre and post purchase type of uh, experience. So it's nice to see that there's more adoption and people are kind of less scared to purchase things online. But uh, yeah, overall, I mean, it's, it's, it's cool to see where it's going. There's lots a lot more interactive stuff happening, you know, like there's all sorts of new innovations, like augmented reality, stuff like that, you know, and that's only going to grow. Uh, especially for things like fashion and whatnot and and like tabletop type of items you know like gadgets and things like for example like i'm looking at this lamp on my desk and it's like kind of a cool lamp you know and it's interesting but if you don't know how really how big it is in scale you can do an ar experience to show someone hey this is what it looks like on your table you know mm -hmm. and a lot of brands are doing that i think ikea is now doing things like that yep. so exactly. so i love that side of things 
you know, the digital interactive aspect, I love so much. And, you know, I'm actually um, experimenting right now with using our logo as a, as a Q, as a Facebook, as a Facebook AR trigger that mm -hmm. could then trigger basically this huge kind of unfolding story of the whole farm and, and the story of how it gets to the consumer. Mm -hmm. That is a, a big project that will take more time and lots of resources to perfect, but I like where that's going because it produces, you know, a deeper connection with the consumer. So um, yeah, generally speaking, you know, e-com is a focus for us. The, the iced tea, however, is, is really a retail play. It's mm -hmm. too, it's, it's too kind of arduous to get people to try something new when it's 30 bucks and, right. you know, it's a bit of a step for them. So retail is great because that's how people discover it. And then they start buying it online and just get it shipped direct to their home. Eventually, you know, there's kind of a, a lot of customers kind of grow into that and, and then they'll do subscriptions, for example. So they really work both hand in hand, I, but retail is definitely like our biggest kind of discovery channel. Okay, great. Well, you have an amazing story from start to finish. It's great to see a company that is literally in its, uh, from, in its supply chain from start to finish also with one of your co-founders and, and, and an exciting product. And I'm looking forward to trying it also. Fortunately, it is here in Calgary where I live. Um, really want to thank you for your time today, Max. Um, again, to remind everybody, we've got Max Revest with Wise Tea here and uh, really a super interesting story and looking forward to seeing more growth from your product going forward. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always fun to share the story and the kind of trials and tribulations of entrepreneurship. Um, and yeah, like having a full touch literally from the absolute, you know, the first batch of coffee leaf tea made in the American continent, you know, north to south, you know, with our bare hands all the way to now growing in a retail and building it all up from the, from scratch. Like it's a, uh, this, it's been a roller coaster, some horrible days and some amazing days, but um, you know, at the end of the day, we're learning a lot. And, and now we're, I feel like we're, we're more polished than ever, you know, and now we're really start to, you know, things are ramping up quickly. So I feel like it's it's been eight years almost of yeah. putting our heart you know our heart and soul into this and now we're starting to see the benefits well excellent and congratulations again and uh once again i'm chris Roskowski, and thank you for joining us here on the future foodcast thanks for listening to future foodcast future foodcast is powered by farm to plate the leading food blockchain platform subscribe on youtube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry 